Now, I gotta say, I was a little nervous going into these first two episodes of Ahsoka. And not just because, like with all Star Wars, I want it to be good, but because this really has to be good after several recent less than stellar efforts with the live action shows. With Andor, in my opinion, being the only truly great thing we've got since, well, since those first couple seasons of The Mandalorian, with some of the shows we've gotten lately being downright bad. I also wanted this to be good for the sake of Dave Filoni, in the hopes that when basically given the reins and more or less total control of a project like he was here, that he could make a smooth transition from animation, where he's done some terrific work, to live action, where he's kind of been an understudy to Jon Favreau until now. Basically, I want to believe that Dave Filoni truly is or was the Padawan of George Lucas, and that, though certainly Lucasfilm has other um, issues or problems it needs to deal with or jettison already, but I want to believe that the future of Star Wars, the future of this franchise, is in good hands with him, or at least with the parts of it he gets to work on. And though I certainly think there were some issues with these first two episodes, issues we'll of course discuss in a moment, I'm happy to say that these first two episodes of the Ahsoka series were pretty good. That I think we may have a rather enjoyable Star Wars series on our hands, especially if you are a fan of one of Filoni's previous works in animation, that of course being Rebels. In fact, as I think we all sort of suspected it would be going into it, this very much is a sequel to or a continuation of that show. It is not trying to hide that fact or pretend it is anything but. And it's so much so a continuation of Rebels that I do wonder how not necessarily confusing this might be to those who haven't seen that show. And I say that because, yeah, thus far the plot has been very straightforward and easy to follow and moved at, well, it hasn't exactly moved at a blistering pace. But I do wonder if some of what we've got so far will leave, again, those who haven't seen Rebels, wondering just a little bit. Like with Hera, for example. She's just kind of there doing her thing or helping out. And if you haven't seen Rebels, you may have no real idea why. You'll of course know she's a general in the New Republic and that clearly there is some history there with Ahsoka and Sabine. But you won't know that she was once basically the mother-like figure of the Ghost Crew that her, Sabine, Ezra, as well as Chopper, Zeb, and Kanan, that they were all once this tight-knit family, basically. That, I'm not sure, is coming across all that well in the little bit we've seen Hera interact with Sabine, for example. It's going to be very interesting to hear from people who haven't seen Rebels how they're feeling about, you know, some of these relationships that we're seeing. And sure, you don't exactly need to know all that. You don't need to know every little relationship or dynamic from Rebels to understand what's going on here. But I do think it'd make a bit more sense and feel more complete if you did. I don't feel like thus far, and it's still pretty early mind you, though technically we're now an hour and a half in so it's not that early. But thus far I don't know that it's done a great job of kind of setting the stage as to why or how all these characters know each other or relate to each other, or why finding Thrawn and or Ezra is so important to them. Now sure, it's done a decent job of showing or building a relationship between Ahsoka and Sabine. That's probably been the strength of the show thus far, and interestingly enough, that's a relationship which isn't really explored or built in Rebels. Those two characters don't have much in the way of interactions in that series. This is all pretty much new territory for everybody with them. So yeah, it's done a really good job when it comes to building this stubborn master and apprentice relationship between them. But it hasn't done a great job at explaining why we should really care about what they're up to. And again, that's mainly for those who haven't seen Rebels, I feel, and don't know Ezra or don't fully grasp the threat that Thrawn poses, outside of the show telling us that it's a big deal, that he could sort of unify and strengthen the Imperial Remnant and start another war. Along these same lines, then, there were a lot of, and I do mean a lot, of subtle callbacks to Rebels or Easter eggs at every turn. Everything from Ryder Azadi's voice actor now playing him in live action, to Jai Kel being a senator, to the Imperial helmets we see stacked up in Sabine's home in the communication tower, the tower that used to be Ezra's home. There are plenty of these little things in there for Rebels fans to notice, and that don't matter so much if they're missed by non-fans. You're not really missing anything, if you will. However, one thing that didn't match with Rebels is the end of the second episode when compared to the epilogue of Rebels, which are supposed to be the same thing or the same event. I'm kind of sad that Ahsoka the White, with her staff and everything, is just kind of not a thing anymore or was never really important. I'd always assume there was some level of significance to the White Robes and her staff, not unlike, yeah, the return of Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. 
but apparently that just kind of got forgotten or retconned, which is rather disappointing, I have to say. Moving on, though, I thought Lothal in live action looked really good. It again felt very true to what we saw in Rebels. I'm sure there are plenty of people who loved the Lothcat in this as well. I also really enjoyed the music. Thus far, it's been some of the best music in a Star Wars series, mainly because, yeah, it felt very Star Wars-like. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel, for better or worse, like some of the other shows have tried to do. Not that they've necessarily had bad scores, but I do like the more traditional Star Wars music in my Star Wars. And speaking of tradition, the opening crawl was also nice to see again, even though it was red and didn't have the usual sort of pomp and circumstance that goes along with an opening crawl. It was instead kind of just there and served its purpose to kind of set the stage. And either way, I was fine with it and just happy to see it back in any form. It's one of those things that should just be a part of Star Wars more often than not, I feel. One thing I didn't exactly love was the rather simple and straightforward plot. The fact that we're once again chasing a map in Star Wars. We once again have to find the thing to get to the place to stop the bad guys from doing the thing. And sure, you can say that's just Star Wars, that this is just the formula it uses or the form it takes all too often. And I guess that's fair enough, but I don't know, maybe Andor has spoiled me a bit, but it would have been nice to just get a little bit more from the plot than, again, looking for a map to find the thing. And speaking of the map, it is uh, interesting that it leads to a whole other galaxy. I mean, sure, Star Wars has explored or taken us to other galaxies before in the expanded universe, but I do feel like there's plenty yet to explore in the main Star Wars galaxy. I was kind of hoping to go to the unknown regions instead of another galaxy entirely. However, I'm not going to say I don't like the idea just yet. Instead, let's see what they do with it, as well as let's also see what they do with the rest of the world building they've been kind of showing or teasing us with in these first two episodes. Let's see if we learn more about this ancient race from the other galaxy who it seems built this gateway between the galaxies. Or, I don't know, maybe they somehow followed or took the Pergils to this galaxy. After all, they were a part of the imagery on the map and on the ruins, and we know that, well, we know that they took Thrawn and Ezra to the other galaxy, so I'd imagine we'll be learning more about them and why they can traverse the universe or move from galaxy to galaxy, and why they were significant to this other race, perhaps. We also just might learn a thing or two more about the Night Sisters, which, as was also heavily suspected, Morgan Elsbeth is one of them, or a survivor of their kind after they were all basically killed in the Clone Wars, other than Marin and, well, now Morgan Elsbeth. And I'm always more than happy to see Star Wars branch out and explore new things, or to elaborate on some of the cooler aspects that have been introduced but not really touched on all that much. And the Night Sisters is one of those things. Moving on now to a slightly annoying thing. I could have done without Sabine getting stabbed in the stomach with a lightsaber. Seems like the only person that's ever killed has been poor Qui-Gon Jinn. And sure, it does show that much to learn Sabine still has that she got stabbed by Shin. And I suppose it's better than her just straight up defeating one of the main antagonists early in the story. Not that that's ever happened in Star Wars before. But it's almost become a meme or laughable at this point to see a character survive a lightsaber gut shot. And speaking of Sabine, it seems we have our answer when it comes to what her training is all about. The training we've seen hinted at or alluded to in all the marketing. And so it seems that she's, well, she's probably force sensitive to some degree, I'd imagine. But that under normal circumstances or back in the days of the prequels, for example, she'd be nowhere near strong enough with the force to be taken and trained to be a Jedi that for some reason Ahsoka feels she should be trained. Though I do wonder if she will um, unlock some of her powers as the series goes on, if it'll turn out that she had some latent abilities the whole time, or if they'll just stick with her training and maybe eventually becoming a Jedi despite the lack of Force powers, which is what I'd much prefer. We don't need every character in Star Wars figuring out someday, somehow, that they have the Force. Another maybe slightly minor annoyance is the utter incompetency of the New Republic. That they can't seem to keep prisoners imprisoned. First it was Moff Gideon in The Mandalorian that escaped during transport, and now it is Morgan Elsbeth who was freed by Balon and Shin during transports. Though I must say, much like Sabine and Ahsoka have been enjoyable on that end of things as the good guys of the show, 
I have been enjoying Balon and Shin. We haven't exactly got a ton from them just yet, but I have liked what we have seen and I am curious to learn more, as I'm curious to learn more about the mysterious Inquisitor named Marok. I mean, I can't help but find it a little odd that Balon, who still seems to have respect or reverence for the Jedi, that he even seems to lament there being so few of them left, yet he's teaming up with an Inquisitor who used to hunt Jedi, or so I'd assume, unless he's not really an Inquisitor, or not a former one, and he's only using the suit to hide his identity, which I suppose is possible we know next to nothing about him, we haven't even heard him speak. Though, speaking of Force and lightsaber wielders, it was nice to get some lightsaber action. I mean, as much as I loved Andor and was cool without seeing a single one in that series, I do love some good lightsaber action, and I thought, for the most part, it was well done here. I actually think Sabine vs. Shin was maybe my favorite of the bunch, or the best looking, but for the most part it was all pretty good. Moving on, I do feel like the pacing could be a bit swifter in some places, which is kind of funny because I was worried going into this. After Dave Filoni made some comments about how he feels like Star Wars or in Star Wars, you always got to keep things moving along, you got to keep the action flowing. Anyway, I was surprised to find this to be actually a bit on the slower side sometimes, and that's not too big of an issue or a problem. I mean, I do appreciate when things set the stage before trying to rush into it. I do appreciate when a show can trust the audience to sit through some build-up and not get bored and tune out. But yeah, it could have picked up the pace just a little bit in some places. Some of the dialogue scenes were or felt like they were pausing quite a bit between talking. It didn't feel very natural at times. Like there was always this brief dramatic pause, like they were trying to, in a way, artificially add some weight to what they were talking about or discussing. Ahsoka had a very deliberate way of talking sometimes, similar to how she spoke a little slower in Rebels when compared to Clone Wars, and probably to show some maturity from Clone Wars, but it was taken to even another level here, I thought. Again, it wasn't too annoying or something that ruined the show by any stretch, but it was something I couldn't help but notice. And so overall, and though I'm probably missing a bunch of things that I wanted to talk about, but no doubt we'll cover them in future videos across this channel and my other one, but anyway, overall, it was a good, solid start. I don't think it was a masterpiece or anything quite like that. There were things that, yep, could have been done better. But I'd have to say I'm eager for more. I'm eager to see where this story is going and what Dave Filoni has in store for us. Well, that's all I got for you this time. Now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you thought of the first two episodes of Ahsoka. Were they everything you were hoping for and more? Or were they maybe a little disappointing? Or were they instead somewhere in between those two? Whatever you do think, leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.